Hello and welcome to today's virtual briefing, The Power of Place. I'm Greg Williams, Editor-in-Chief of Wired and delighted that you could join us today. A couple of quick important points before we begin. You could submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we are recording this session and we'll gladly send you a copy of the link afterwards. In today's session, we'll be exploring how the pandemic has impacted organizations and the workplace and what this means for business and people in the new era. We'll be investigating the future of smart spaces, how employees would like to return to work, and the need for offices to move towards human-centric hubs that are designed to help improve well-being, increase productivity, and promote a sense of belonging within the workplace. I'm delighted to be joined today by Matt Blowers, the Chief Operating Officer of ISG's Global Fit Out business. While at ISG, Matt's been spearheading the expansion of the company in new geographies and sectors. He's focused on improvements in quality management and project completions and launched ISG's logistics and distribution division. Matt continues to push boundaries across the industry to ensure that tech and innovation are at the forefront of construction. Matt, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Hi, Greg. So, uh, very excited to discuss this piece of research that ISG has conducted into trends in the workplace. Clearly, an area that we're all thinking about at the moment, uh, given the circumstances. Uh, maybe it'd be helpful to, to those watching you. First of all, you can give us an overview of ISG, uh, the kind of companies you work with, the kind of work you do, and then tell us a little bit about the, the research and its, its key findings. Yeah, so, so thanks, Greg. And hello, everybody. It's, uh, I've got to say it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, so firstly, a quick introduction on ISG. So we're a global construction services company uh, and we specialise in a few key sectors. So firstly, there's fit out, where we have a very proud legacy of delivering some great workplaces across the globe. And, that, and that's for all sorts of different clients and different sectors um, and a significant amount of tech companies. Then we've got an engineering services business, which is, again, is a global service and involves construction of hyperscale data centres, high tech manufacturing facilities, laboratories, science and health facilities. And in the UK, we have more of a general construction business, which has a particular specialism now for sort of major projects and more increasingly in recent times, the public sector. So I guess, you know, my role at ISG being responsible for the global fitter area is pretty much, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to get first-hand experience of the different workplace environments across geographies. Now, as a business, we've always been really interested in understanding more about how the workplaces that we create impact the human behaviors of the people that use them. So I guess it was late 2019 or early 2020, we, question, we, we decided to undertake a survey to really dig a bit, dig a bit deeper into that. So we, um, we questioned over five and a half thousand people first off from around the globe. Then, then the pandemic took hold, as, as we all know, when lockdown happened and all of a sudden people were thrown into this unplanned social experiment about working remotely. So we thought it actually would then be really interesting to follow up on that survey to understand the difference of how people were then feeling about you know, a return to the workplace and where expectations and opinions might be different from what they were before. And it gave us some really interesting insights. And I guess it's, you know, it's all summarised in a report we've got called The Power of Place, which you've already mentioned, which people can download from our website if they, uh, if they want more information. With regard to the key findings, I guess we're probably going to discuss some of those as we go through the questions, Greg. So it might be easier if we just carry on with that, if that's OK. Sure, sure. yes. The top line question, obviously, for a lot of people working, uh, many of whom would have been working from home for, for close to a year now. Um, most organisations have discovered that it's, it's really effective in many, many roles. Um, should we start calling time on the office as we know it, do you think? Well, you know, there's no doubt technology has definitely allowed businesses to, to achieve that continuity. And in some instances, definitely increased productivity. You know, things like Zoom and Teams, like we're using now, and other devices have revolutionised the way we're going to work forever. And clearly there's there's definitely no going back to what it used to be. However, what interesting enough, what the research did show us is that people are really missing the office. Mm. Both employees and employers both see between two and three days in the office a week as the best option for them, which is really interesting. So I don't believe there's going to be like, as, you, as you'd call a calling time when it comes to the office. I think people want to come to the office and employers want them to come in too. But inevitably, I guess things are going to be very different when they do come back. Yeah, and that, that begs a question, thinking about, you know, specifically about the, the 
in bar every two days a week in the office for most people. How do you see the office space changing because of that? Well, again, re reflecting back on the research, that clearly showed us that people wanted access to more personal space. And the right. primary reason they're going to be coming into the office will be to collaborate, right? And that's, that's going to be a journey they're going to want to make. So the emphasis of that will have to be the facilities they provide. And also having the right technology will be really important as well. And in fact, I was, I was talking to um, one of our customers at one of the big tech companies um, we work with. And whilst you know, they indicate that actually they're, they're definitely going to be expecting less people in the office on a daily basis, but the people who will come in will inevitably want more space around them. So actually the overall size of the footplate will probably won't change, but the purpose and the flexibility of that space will need to be different to ensure that people get the experience they need whether that be like a quiet time or tradition, a traditional transactional meeting or even a more creative session where that, you know, that creative spark happens. So, you know, I guess, you know, we believe firmly that it's very smart employers who are going to be thinking about revolutionising the meeting rooms into creative, collaborative and fun spaces mm. that are you know, sort of compelling and irreplaceable places that people would want to travel to use, if that makes sense. Yeah. You can't get that at home. So I yeah. guess the traditional rows of desks and the traditional meeting room with a big table and the chairs placed around it, you know, that, that will have to change to facilitate that. Well, as you say, there's going to be lots of change. We're going to be looking at, you know, transitioning back into the office, you know, who, who knows quite when, but certainly, you know, at some point uh, in 2021, in, in most cases, uh, from the kind of aspect or the perspective, I should say, of organisations, um, what kind of challenges do you think they are going to face as we start seeing teams transition back into office environments? Because not all office buildings are going to be, you know, purpose built in the way that maybe some of the, you know, the, the tech companies you work with are, you know, what kind of challenges do you foresee organisations having? Well, I think, you know, the, the main challenge is what we've already faced, you know, in the first wave when people did start to come back after that. And that's first and foremost, you've got to make the office a safe place to be. Well, yeah. That's the number one that people are going to expect. What, what we believe is individuals, therefore, we're going to make, we're going to want a much bigger say in their experience. So the challenge is now one a bit more of curation and individual choice, I think. You know, we used to base office occupancy on a, on a full occupancy model. We now got to think about who's going to be in and when, what is it they want to do when they get there, and whereabouts in the building will that be? So you know, that's a really complex piece there, isn't it? So what choices, yeah. when they, when, even when they get there, what choices will they want to make when they arrive? How do you, how do you cater for that? And I, you know, and I guess that's a call out really for the technology, isn't it? Because I'm sure technology is going to help play a really big part of that whole selectivity process for, for the use of an office. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned tech there, uh, uh, Matt. I'm really interested to get your, your thoughts on, you know, obviously we, we've all been using kind of collaborative you know, enterprise software over the last year in, in ways maybe we, we hadn't expected to be so, so certainly so reliant on it. Um, what uses do you think tech is going to have? And I'm, I'm not in this new built environment. I'm not just thinking about productivity tools. I'm thinking about how are we going to keep people safe using tech? What are you seeing there? So, you know, firstly, the, the technology is already there, right? It's just a case, I think, of how we join all of this up. Um, you know, there are simple things that, such as, you know, we use smart buildings all the time, right? But things like smart buildings can integrate with intelligent signage. So they, that's used to communicate key messages when people come into the building, whether that's, you know, adaptable one-way circulation routes, depending on what's happening in the space, or even heat maps um, to demonstrate what is what areas in the building are populated higher if you want to be, you know, safe and, and, and a bit more alone. And even then to this very simple things like automatic doors and corridors to avoid any contact points on handles from people from people using them but i guess the more interesting aspect is you know looking at the possibilities that surround other technologies things like you know facial recognition is an example it's not it's not i mean it is becoming more commonplace about you know using facial recognition to get into places but imagine that you know with a facial recognition scan getting into a building it then triggers you know the making of your favorite coffee that you go and pick up from a place a safe place within five minutes of arriving it also tells you you know, the best spaces and what you want to use for your preferences you've got on that day. And it tells you directions within that building of how to get there. And also it will ensure that you maintain enough personal space around you for both safety, for your physical and mental condition. And I guess, you know, the possibilities there are endless, really. And I think the pandemic is definitely making a lot of companies work the tech they've already got a lot harder. 
And just looking broadly, we've all obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we've been all been relying on these kind of, you know, enterprise tools that maybe we weren't, you know, going to be embracing in the way that we have seen anything, you know, in the, in, in the, over the last sort of, you know, six to eight months in the way that we're using tech now in, 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 in different ways that might sort of offer us sort of like learnings for how the physical space might operate? So I think one of one of the things we have seen is potentially how you make um, sort of this kind of interaction or even interactive in a hybrid environment much more encompassing for the people who aren't in that space. And, you know, I reflect on the entertainment market at the moment. So we, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of the viewers here will be watch talent shows like um, The Voice. And you see these whole walls of screens done of the audience all being remotely trying to create that, um, that ambience to the, to the site. And to the sorry to the program. So if you think about it from perspective, like a Zoom meeting, you know, when when people are remote, how do we make sure that those people who aren't in the space, when the debate is happening in the here and now, don't yeah. feel don't feel about left out? How does so? I, I know I've been remote when it, when it's been meetings with people in the room. Now that's inevitably going to be much more common. So it's how do you make that feeling more interactive for them and make them feel like they're, they're not left out? Unfortunately, people can't have Halo suites in their house, so it's really you know, what, how can we leverage technology to make that much more interactive to that meeting? Yeah, and you mentioned, I think, something that's really sort of like risen to the fore over the last few months, which is, which is mental health. Um, how can we promote that when we're rethinking the spaces in, in, in the built environment as we begin to return back? What, what, how can we adapt our spaces? How can we try and promote uh, mental health? Do you know what? So I was thinking about this, actually, but the use of technology, right? There's, there's a reason why we're all so exhausted when we're using it all day you know, on our devices. You know, we only get a tiny fraction of the visual language we normally get from being in a room together. So your brain is constantly working really hard trying to pick up on all of these signals. So, you know, it is a bit like we're all using the same venue to socialise and go to work, which, you know, clearly, clearly isn't healthy. So I think the office ultimately is it's a really important part for mental health. It, not only does it provide that, that work-life distinction that people want, but it's the human interaction that also is so important for mental health. And what is true, though, I think, with the built environment space or the office, the emphasis of those spaces is going to have to shift. It's going to need to greater focus on things like access to natural light and fresh air, outdoor spaces. You know, I've already spoken about personal choice, but that more space per person and more opportunities to collaborate safely. You know, we've already seen a movement in a lot of people opting for natural ventilation. That's going to be much more increasing, I think, when people do return to the office, and that's good for your well-being as well. Yeah, that makes it that makes a lot of sense. Um, clearly, you know, it's wired. So we have to talk about data. You know, large organisations now are using data largely for external purposes in terms of you know offer, offering offering a business you know competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe one area where there's a lot of opportunity is like how can uh, organisations use internal data for the well-being of their teams? Um, is there anything that we can kind of look at in the built environment that might offer us kind of data points that will be, uh, you know, helpful uh, for, for many of the, uh, you know, the concerns and the issues that you um, uh, 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 talked about already? Yeah, so it, it, it's true. Like, we're, we're just like every other company. We, we collect data in so many different areas on a regular basis, things like customer experience. And, and one of those is actually our employee wellbeing. So, you know, in our experience, speaking you know, from our experience, the most important part about data is to really play that back to our people of what we find and then where, where the pinch points are, ask them the question about what it is that we could do to help them. Because that's, that's the key to anything you learn is understanding how you can improve it. And then what we do is then we try and reshape the offer we've got, whether that be, you know, facilities or adaptability of spaces. You know, there's, there's no, the interesting point here is also there's no one size fits all. And it's very difficult to try and please everybody. But understanding a good common trend is, is really useful in that area. And we also, we, we partner with things like Mental Health UK, um, especially now, because that gives all of our people the access to a curated range of resources to, to help them in their well-being, which is inevitably a challenge at the moment. Sure. I mean, that one size fits all, you know, approach to the office that you mentioned, Matt, you know, it's the way that most organisations have been thinking for a long, long time. Rows of desks, you know, kind of cramming people in. 
I think, you know, you've mentioned already that business is going to have to start thinking more about individuals, especially uh, with, you know, concerns around diversity inclusion, which, which most organizations are really trying to address now. Uh, how do you think a more kind of personalized a- approach, what would that look like? So, so without a doubt, right, individual choice is, is going to be a massive factor. So, and I think technology has got a huge role to play here. Imagine like going into the office and you use an app to make your ambitions for the day really clear and that your day in the space is therefore it's going to be personalized to exactly what your ambitions are. So, you know, who do you want to see? What kind of, what kind of activities you're going to do? What will you need? Uh, do you need an hour of quiet uh, and reflection halfway through the day? Do you need to brainstorm with some grads that you never met before? You know, tech could give you endless degrees of personalization, but you know, the challenge for the office space has got to be is how, how do you make that so flexible enough to cater for it? That, that's a real challenge. And then on top of that, obviously, the inclusivity is really important here as well. You know, as I said already, one size doesn't fit all. So we have to bear in mind that not everybody is better suited to being in an office. Some people work better remotely, you know, whether for whatever reason it might be. So as I've already mentioned, the tech that's developed and used, having them feeling much more engaged and interactive with the space when they can't be in the office is, is going to be really important. Yeah, that's super interesting. So in your, to your mind, you know, with, with what you've just said in mind, um, do, do you think our physical spaces are going to need to be a lot more fluid than they are? They're, quite the moment, they're pretty rigid, right? You've got the rows of desks. How will that fluidity, fluidity you think, manifest itself? So, yeah, we'll definitely need to be more fluid, right? So those days of rows and rows of desks are gone. So, again, I'm going back to flexibility, but with more personalization comes that creative challenge. It's the spontaneity. How do the spaces adapt quickly to the population on any given day? How does desk, desk space adapt to become collaboration space? You know, I talk to architects and designers all the time and, and be honest with you, it's a, it's a really big challenge for everyone in the built environment right now. You know, and it's live and it's right here and now where people are, are all putting together their solutions for what that might be. I haven't got the, the one word answer really, unfortunately, because it's going to be a developing thing. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, this is this is a process. And I think that, you know, as for the last, you know, sort of, you know, whatever, 10 months, uh, you know, we're, we're discovering a lot of things that maybe we, we wouldn't have thought of in the past. And also we're being, a, you know, being able to apply our learnings. Um, so they have, they, I think there will be, you know, there is a, you know, obviously it's a terrible, terrible thing that's happened over the past year, but hopefully we'll be able to take some, some of the learnings from it forward and actually create you know, sort of like, you know, better spaces and, 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 and create workplaces, which are, as you say, more diverse, more inclusive and, 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 and support people's mental health. So one area around that, I think, obviously all organizations are now thinking about is like, how can we retain talent? You know, we, the, the, we, there really is, you know, a, a talent war going on in many organizations, particularly in the tech industry. What, what do you think that we've learned during the pandemic with mind retaining, you know, you know, your, your teams? So, you know, just, just like the tech sector, right? We, um, we, we come, I come from a sector where there's massive competition for attracting and retaining talent. Um, but at the same time, what we have seen is the people are looking for a bit of stability now in uncertain times. So there's definitely a little bit less movement around there. But you know what? Looking ahead, I really believe it's going to be those businesses that wake up to the fact that that post-pandemic world is going to be different. And they need to make those changes now. We've all learned that we can beyond, work beyond the constraints of a normal office environment. But we also know that we don't like everything about the new world we're in, right? So retaining talent, it's all going to come down to being agile to, 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 to make sure we can cater for those individuals' personal choice. And that could be the location, having offices that are closer to, um, to more regional locations rather than having to travel into that large company headquarters in London. But it could also be about, you know, the workspace you've got at home and in the office. And it's those companies, I think, who get on that front foot now that we're going to be the ones that are retaining and attracting the best talent because it's all about choice. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I think there's going to be sort of like a degree of fluidity there. And I think that, you know, we have worked efficiently from home. Many organisations, though, do feel that teams have become disconnected. Um, Culture is going to be really important. How do you think we can nurture culture using the built environment as we begin to return? That's a really interesting question, right? And it's been a real challenge that I'm sure every organization's faced and and our organization is no different, right? Working working remotely is is difficult for a lot of people. And interestingly, our research showed that there was a real direct correlation that the more positively people feel about the space they work in, 
the more likely they are going to feel connected to the employer's values, which clearly is important for nurturing that culture you want to achieve. So I guess for the built environment, it's really important that the workplace identifies that vision and values through its design and functionality. So whether, whether that be through the technology or the adaptability for the tasks that needed to be done. Well, we're getting plenty of questions coming in, Paul. So I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions if you've got time, and then we'll move on to sort of like some of the questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, one one area that I think would be really interesting to dig into you with, with you is that um, in, in terms of, you know, staff churn, attracting the best talents, clearly there is going to be best practice and clearly all physical spaces how do you think businesses just and again this is a you know top line question so we're talking sort of like you know maybe sort of some of the the, the key findings from the survey how do you think organizations businesses generally should be thinking about driving competitive competitive advantage through you know what you describe as the power of place so so workplaces, clearly, they play, a, they play a pivotal role for businesses, right? And the research clearly shows that when people feel positively towards a place, they also feel much more connected to the brand values and the ability to work effectively. You know, you have to look at um, investing in a workplace being as a direct investment in people. So one of the statistics, which I thought was actually um, quite, quite a scary statistic in our research, was that over 50%, I think it was 51% of Gen Z and millennials said they would be more likely to join another business if there was a better quality state, better quality state of the art workplace. And that's a dangerously high statistic over a facility that some, some businesses look at purely as a bottom line cost rather than an investment, don't you agree? I think, you know, and, and that's also reflected in staff engagement, right? It's a well-known fact that any business with a population of highly engaged people are more successful. Yeah, purpose-driven yeah. businesses generally. Yeah, so the role of the place is to provide the people with that emotional connection that employees have with that brand value and culture. And then that purely, that will have a direct impact on their engagement and ultimately business performance. So I guess, you know, sorry, Greg, go on. No, no, please go ahead. I, I interrupted you, apologies. I was, gonna, I was just going to wrap up. But so I was going to say, but I think when, when the power of the place is fully embraced, then I honestly believe there's a genuine opportunity there for competitive advantage to be realised. And I guess that's what ultimately the, the survey we produced kind of gets to that conclusion. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, looking at the questions, we've got plenty coming in. I mean, there's, there's two or three that really touch on sort of like something s similar, which is around um, sustainability and how we can best implement that into our, 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 our working spaces. Um, how do you think about that? What are the ways that organizations can, you know, if they're maybe not doing a build from scratch, but maybe they're actually thinking about how they transform their offices with COVID in mind, what, what are the most sort of, you know, thoughtful ways that they can, can have an impact? So the, the, I've already mentioned one of them, which is obviously natural ventilation. If that's, if that's a feasible option for an existing building, then that would something definitely recommend that natural ventilation helps. There are also um, air conditioning units which can be selected to help with, you know, control of um, spreading of viruses and, things and the like, such as that. But I think, you know, again, it's adjacencies to, to natural light, outdoor spaces, all of those things, which, you know, they're, they're not new. People like them, don't they? They make people feel better. I think that's a, that's a really important factor. And there's a lot of initiatives now and also, you know, demands on our industry to try and develop buildings in a much more sustainable way. And there's a there's a couple of other questions that are kind of I'll, I'll I'll maybe conflate a little bit because they kind of touch on the sort of similar area. So one from um, uh, Paul Dowling, who works in the Knowledge Quarter Deep Tech ecosystem around King's Cross, and he's thinking about sort of like encouraging startups how they come back. So maybe you know we're talking about office share, right? Mainly you know sort of like companies that have you know multiple companies, sorry, buildings that have multiple companies in them. And then um, a question from Louise Baird, who works in relocating companies, and she's usually working to a desk sharing ratio of, of, of 10 people for, for eight desks. Do you, and I guess the question is around sort of space. Do you see density now being something that is, um, that is, 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 it becomes a real kind of like challenge for organizations um, and figuring out who's gonna be in when and, and how to make sure that, that people are safe? Absolutely. And I guess that, that goes back to one of uh, one of the questions we've already had really about, you know, technology has got a huge part to play because you need to understand who's going to be in, because inevitably, if people do say come into the office three days a week, then there's going to be this rotational factor of a 60% population in that space, right? So you need to understand who's going to be there 
who they want to work with, what neighborhood they're in, what facilities they need. And, and the best way of doing that is tech. We've all, you know, we've probably all got Microsoft Teams, which has the shifts element on it, which enables people to look at who's going to be where at any one time. It's about working that kind of technology harder. And, and without a doubt, the days, my opinion, is the days of the um, 10 people to eight desks row to row are long gone. They're going to have to change. Desks are going to have to be closer, well, spaced further apart. And the occupancy of any building inevitably will, will, will reduce. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time today. We've had some great questions coming in. I think that, you know, the, 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 what the survey clearly shows is that there is, you know, a lot of opportunity, you know, to create kind of, you know, cultures internally that are, you know, really, really powerful and help businesses move forward. If you did enjoy the session, please do check out other episodes of Wired Briefings at wired.co.uk. Uh, we're also excited to announce that Wired Health is returning on March the 31st. You can uh, find out more and book your place on the Wired website. Uh, and thank you again to Matt for joining us today, all of you for watching this session. Um, stay well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Matt.